I will be on time because I'm between you and lunch, and I know that's a dangerous position to be in for a speaker. I've given a lot of talks in the last year and a half, as Scott alluded to, kind of all over the world, about this issue of sea level rise. But I can honestly say that I've looked forward to this talk for, I think, the three or four months since John and Ariel invited me to give a keynote because of who you represent and at several levels. You're both some regulatory and governmental, but you're a lot of mostly private business. And the Bay Area, of all the areas that I visited regularly in the last year, has some real uniqueness. It has a lot of vulnerability because of the fill land in the inshore, as you call it, inside the Bay. And groups like the Bay BCDC, working with USGS and others, have given you maps, such as the one shown there that show you what's at stake. But this is a different issue. And the fact that you've made it the theme of today's conference is exciting because it gets to the crux of or the, the connection between regulation and governance and public policy, economics and business and commerce, what do companies do and how do we plan ahead. And the Bay Planning Coalition and their decision makers conference is something that I just saw as a, as a really exciting opportunity. So what my purpose today in between the, the morning panel and the afternoon and some, some awards is to really give you a long-term picture of why sea level is going to go up no matter what we do, to invite us to think a little bit differently than we do on day-to-day -day planning. Um, let's see. One of the challenges with sea level rise is that it's changed a lot since Scott and I went to school and, and uh, studied geology. The geologic time scale of sea level rise, which went along with the ice ages, was something which happened in thousands of years. We studied it in paleogeology, but never thought it would change in our lifetimes. We're in a new era. And we need to understand facts from fiction. When you think of sea level rise, you often think of ports and airports, certainly here in the Bay Area. But the effects of sea level rise are much more pervasive than just those iconic and huge structures that don't move easily or get lifted easily and warrant long-term planning. Because sea level rise gets to all coastal areas and all areas on tidal rivers, like Sacramento. We don't think of it that way often, but the earth and sea walls that go up to Sacramento are also very vulnerable to slowly rising sea level. And of course, as you people here dealing with the ports know, even if you live in Denver, Colorado, your goods come through ports. And the farmers in Iowa are very interested in sea level rise because their goods go out through ports. So it's a unique subject. So let's start with a couple of quick basics just to set the framework right, that sea level is the baseline. Again, in centuries, we never really thought it was going to change much, even though it started to. On top of that, we're used to daily tides, storm tides, and when they happen together, extreme tides. And for each foot of rise, the shoreline moves inland as a global average about 300 feet. And while that may seem surprising, if you think about it out in the Pacific where it's a steep coast, it's not nearly 300 to 1. But on the inshore where it's very shallow and flat, like Foster City or Redwood City, it's probably 1,000 to 1 because it's flat land. Like Sort of like Florida, where I live. So the effect of another foot of sea level, or even a few inches, can be dramatic. Now we think of storms like Sandy. And this is probably a photograph you saw something like this a year and a half ago when Sandy breached the shoreline in New Jersey, which pointed out that an extreme storm hitting at a fairly extreme high tide does extra dev devastation. We're seeing another phenomenon now, extreme tides. You call them king tides out here. In Florida, they call this a sunny day flood event. Not a storm, not rainfall, but the streets flood. And they're happening every 28 days. It's a famous street in Miami called uh, Alton Road. A lot of residents still think that a water main must have broken last night. Or maybe there was a downpour in the middle of the night. They haven't quite figured out that it, they could predict this with the tide table. 
That didn't happen three or four decades ago. We are in a new era, folks, and it has crept up on us, or perhaps not crept up on us, but it's, it's overtaken us before we've even seen it. There are neighborhoods where there are storm drains put in to take excess rainfall to the nearest waterway. Every 28 days, the water backs up, and at certain months of the year, in extreme cases, it backs up as fully as this would show. And that salt water coming from the intercoastal waterway back up onto the street, it wasn't designed to work in that direction. And king tides again in the Embarcadero. May look playful, but again, somebody would say, you know, that didn't used to happen when I was a kid, or certainly not as often. Now, let's step back and I'm going to give you a couple of graphs. I'm going to try and keep this fairly simple. I, I know graphs are tough to, to see in, an, in a room like this, so I'll try and oversimplify them. This is sea level for the last 150 years, since 1850. As they say in the investment world, the trend can be your friend no matter which way it's going, as long as you can see the trend. And I would submit to you that if you look at this global sea level change in the last 163 years, that the trend can be your friend, even though it may be bothersome or something you wish were different. Unfortunately, many scientists and many skeptics and many uh, politicians like to say, well, look, maybe, maybe it's going to keep going down you know, when there's a little downtick. I think if you liken that to a stock chart or the price of gold, you'd know which side of the equation you wanted to be on you wouldn't care what it did last week or that it blipped down. Because unless there's some countervailing powerful evidence, that chart's going to keep going in that direction. And San Francisco has had about eight inches of global sea level rise in that century. But one of the reasons sea level rise is so confusing is it happens differently in different places. This graph, which I don't ask you to look at the different names there, but on the far left is New Orleans. In the middle is New York and Miami, and in the far right is Los Angeles at the low end. What this shows is the red wavy line near the bottom is that eight inch global average, which is pretty much what's happened to San Francisco in the last century. But New Orleans has had 46 inches, Norfolk 30 inches, New York 14, and Los Angeles four. And you'd say, well, how could sea level rise eight inches globally and be that diverse from 46 to four? Well, the difference is, Land, as Scott would tell you, of course, uplift or subsidence. Land moves in fractions of an inch per year, and it's either going to add to or subtract from sea level. Los Angeles, which is lifting up because of the Pacific Plate going underneath California, which is the cause of all the earthquakes, has reduced global sea level from eight inches to just four inches in that area because the land's four inches higher. But it all adds to the impression of confusion. So let's look at a big picture. Since the last ice age, 20,000 years ago at the left-hand side of that chart, sea level was down 390 feet. And it rose to the present level about 6,000 years ago. That's pretty much the beginning of our civilization, our written record keeping. Probably explains, explains why we have trouble believing that sea level will change much. And not only has it risen, but it does it unevenly. There were some big jumps in there in the middle, long before man had an impact. So why would sea level change three, three or 400 feet? It's because of the ice ages. Nobody disputes the ice ages. It's happened, few would know unless they studied geology, two things. The last ice age was peaked about 20,000 years ago. And the ice ages happened in about a 100,000 year cycle for millions of years. And I'll need to give you just a little more information about the ice ages. And I don't want to get, it, get too technical, but if you remember the four part scientific series, particularly part two, ice age, the meltdown, my daughter was six when this came out, and uh, I watched it about 20 times, not by choice. But behind Manny and Sid and Diego and Scat, and I can't remember the other two names, but behind those characters, there's two miles of ice. And that 10,000 feet of ice, just 20,000 years ago, as it melted, it raised the ocean, 390 feet. And we need to get the facts straight and get rid of the fiction about sea level rise. This is a really big deal, particularly to all of you in this room here. Whether you run a port, whether you're a governmental authority, whether you're a consulting firm, a law firm, we need to see the new era that we're in. 
The first misunderstanding about sea level is that the melting polar ice cap around the North Pole adds to sea level rise. It does not. The disappearance of the polar ice cap may threaten the polar bear's habitat has no effect on sea level. It's floating ice. And like any ice cube, whether it be an iceberg or an ice cube in a glass of iced tea, if it's floating, as it melts, it does not change the level of liquid. It takes the ice on land, which is dominantly Greenland or Antarctica, to melt and run to the ocean or break off into an iceberg that falls into the ocean to change the level of sea level. There's enough ice on land to raise sea level 212 feet. That can happen this century. It can happen next, or next, next century. Don't panic. But we need to understand what can happen. In fact, what will happen? Because otherwise, we're going to go underwater. The glaciers, surprisingly, which also add to sea level as they melt, all the glaciers in the world, when they melt, will add two or three feet of sea level. That includes Alaska, the Alps, every glacier on the planet. Easy calculation. Greenland, by contrast, has enough ice frozen by itself to raise sea level 24 feet. Antarctica, 186 feet. So this isn't small stuff, and this isn't a theory. It's not an opinion. Ice melts at 32 degrees, whether you're Republican or Democrat. To put it in visual perspective, all of human civilization, call it five or 6,000 years, we have been at the 30th floor of the building, just to give you a visual. 20,000 years ago at the last ice age and the preceding ice ages, sea level was at the ground floor, 30 stories down. And when all the ice again melts, sea level will rise another 17 floors, another 212 feet. This is not something to be trivialized, ignored, hoped it won't happen. Now, that won't happen preferably for thousands of years. But as you know, a few feet of sea level rise makes a big difference. The problem comes from areas like Antarctica, which is kind of hard to understand because it just seems white. But this is a map that's been color-coded for showing rates of change in the glaciers. And the areas at the 8 o'clock position in that chart in red are very ominous. In fact, they made the front page of most newspapers this week because there are three studies published this week in scientific journals which confirm something that many of us have said for years, that if you understand what's happening on Greenland and Antarctica, that most of the scientific projections that we normally cite, like the IPCC and the National Research Council and the National Climate Assessment, perhaps unintentionally, but underestimate or understate what can happen from a few places like Antarctica. Let's look at sea level in one simple graph going back four ice age cycles, 400,000 years from left to right. The right hand side's the present. And what you see is a fairly regular pattern, and it goes with the ice ages. In a moment, I'll add on top of that a red graph for global average temperature, which also shows you ice ages, and then a green one for carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. And when you line up 400,000 years from left to right, of a greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, and global average temperature, and sea level rise from geologic records, you see an amazing pattern. Not only is there a regular repeat cycle that varies between 95 and 125,000 years, we'll call it 100,000 for simplicity, but the three peaks of all the, the, the peaks of all three lines line up. And I don't have time here to get into that. And by the way, I should say that besides this half hour section of your day today, the Bay Planning Coalition has suggested that we run a longer workshop. And if you're interested, please let Ariel know, and I think they're gonna do some polling of you. But I've agreed to come back here if we can find a suitable venue. And those of you that have venues suitable for workshops might wanna contact Ariel. So that those that wanna understand this in more detail can do so with not only yourselves or your, your senior staff people. But what's interesting to see here is that there are four ice age cycles in 400,000 years, long before man had any impact. And we're at the high spot on the far right-hand side of sea level, 
the normal temperature range and the normal carbon dioxide range. The problem is in the far upper right, that little red circle, showing that carbon dioxide has left the 180 to 280 parts per million range of the last 10 million years and is now at 400 parts per million and climbing. And if you take the last 50 years and blow that up a little bit and look at the projections, the three lines keep moving together. And there's some basic physics why that happens. Simplest is that as the planet warms, ice melts and the sea level rises. And here's the surprising and perhaps unfortunate truth that we can no longer stop this. The oceans are already a degree and a half Fahrenheit warmer than they were a century ago. And that extra heat that's now captured in the ocean can't be removed in a matter of decades. So we are stuck with a warmer ocean. And a warmer ocean means that the ice will melt for centuries. Even if we do all of the right energy conservation and adaptation and mitigation and all the other green and sustainable efforts that many of you participate in, the sad and uh, just reality is that the planet has changed temperature naturally in the past. We've now broken it out of that cycle. And we need to start thinking about a new reality. We're in a new era. It is unstoppable. We can slow sea level rise. We can't stop it. There's a real lag time between heat and melting huge ice sheets. Two or three miles of ice still exist. Even if we brought the temperature back down, sea level would still rise for centuries. We can slow it, and we should try and do that. But we need to adopt to a new reality. And we get that data, by the way, with probably don't have time in this talk. I think I'm running toward the end, and we won't allow time for questions. But the ice cores from Antarctica to Greenland allow us to go back 800,000 years, and the air bubbles that are trapped in those ice slivers can be dated to within the layers of ice within three years. And we can go into those air bubbles and sample the air and get, just like tree rings, kind of trap ancient growths of trees and give us data. So do the ice cores. The uh, IPCC report and other governmental reports talk about 10 to 32 inches of sea level rise or the 11 inches by mid-century from the National Research Council. Do not count the uncertainties like Antarctica and methane release. Their methodology is a different question. They're not asking risk or probability. They're asking scientists, what do they know will happen that they can quantify this century? And those two very unknowns of methane and West Antarctic glacier collapse or ice sheet collapse don't meet those tests. So they're explained in the footnotes as unknowns. Now, how do scientists do in predicting sea level rise? Well, not very well. This was the IPCC projection from 1990, shown in three different bands of confidence, just coming out to the present on the right-hand side. In 2002, 12 years later, they added some, shown here in green, some projections were revised. They're a little bit higher, a little narrower. But now we can look back and say, how did the scientific community, particularly the IPCC, do in projecting sea level rise? Not very well. Shown in gold there is sea level, and red is the trend line of sea level. Sea level in just the last two decades was at the top or exceeded all of the projections by the scientific community. So some of them are saying how good they were, what their intentions were, their accuracy. But the truth is, even if you ask them, they weren't asking the question of what could happen. They were asking the question of what will happen that they can predict and do it with a number and have like a 90% confidence. And as a result, any uncertainties are left on the table. But methane's coming out of the ground. Methane is a huge accelerant to warming. We can't control it. So to the question of how high sea level rise in 30 years, which is a good planning horizon, a lot of you amortize assets and, and do planning with looking at a 30 years so you can do better five-year planning or even near term. The truth is we don't know the answer to that. We don't know how warm we're going to get because we don't know how we're going to produce our energy. We don't know it would be coal, tar sands, nuclear, solar. Those are fair questions. But if you don't know how much heat you're, heat you're putting in the system, you don't know how warm it will get, you don't know how quickly the ice will melt. And on top of that, we've never warmed this quickly in 500 million years. So the projections are just projections. Nobody wants to scare anybody, and, and that's not my purpose, and I'm sure it's not your interest 
to uh, scare anybody or be scared, but as good planners, we need to look ahead and say what could happen. And so while this may be daunting and to some degree depressing and paralyzing, having worked on this for years and communicating it to diverse audiences, I'd like to leave you with three positive thoughts. I sometimes refer to it as my glass half full as opposed to the glass half empty of the bad news. And the three thoughts are this. Most disasters we have to deal with, like tsunamis and tornadoes or earthquakes, give us no warning. This one gives us decades of warning. We actually have time to plan. That's a blessing. The second is when we focus on a problem, we do amazing things. We know that, from medical research to electronics to uh, putting a man on the moon. When we embrace the two problems of dealing with the coastline that's going to move inland because of a sea level that's rising, at unprecedented rates, we will do some really great stuff. But first, we've got to stop playing politics and just burying our head in the sand. This is a revolutionary concept. The Earth is changing in ge normally geologic time. It's happening on human time scale. We need to deal with that. Out of crisis comes opportunity, economic opportunity. Those that can see where the trend is heading will change their businesses and adapt maybe sell some assets, maybe create some new assets, create some new technologies, create some new services. And I think there is an opportunity there. And the third is, if you agree with me with this view of basically simple physics and its impact, then we have an opportunity and an obligation to share this new world, the word about this new world that really is quite different than anything that's happened in 100,000 years. We need to tell our kids, our colleagues, our business associates, our communities, companies we invest with, that listen, this isn't a political opinion. Ice melts at 32 degrees. The ocean is warmer. The ice will keep melting. The sea will keep rising. And the shoreline will keep shifting inland. The difference between storms, tides, and sea level rise is that they combine for impact. But a storm recedes in days. A high tide recedes in hours. Sea level cannot recede for a thousand years. It needs to be thought of differently. And as a final plug, I, I, I uh, do live in Florida. I come out here a lot, thanks to the invitation of Will Travis and Zach Wasserman and others in the room here and uh, BCDC and others. I, um, there's been some talk about even creating a sea level institute out here, a nonprofit. And uh, if any of you have interest in that, uh, it's something that I would be, I've been. And the Bay Area has encouraged that kind of regional thinking for a long time. And I think bringing thought leadership here on a full-time, as Scott said, 365-day-a-year basis has a lot of merit and could be beneficial to both you and the understanding of this subject on an international basis. So uh, that's probably a later discussion, but thank you very much.